and how dense the cataract is. So we all know that a soft cataract is easier than a dense cataract, and we have zero control of that. So what you do then is you can change it to a, <clears throat> a sign like this, which tells you that it, it, something varies as something else. Well, if something varies as something else, that means one of them is one you can control, and one then is dependent. And in mathematics, we call one the independent variable, and the one that just is determined by what you did, the dependent variable. So what happens in peristaltic pumps, the flow is set as an independent variable. So you know that on your FACO machines, if you use an Alcon machine or, or uh, an AMO machine, you, you set the flow rate. And when you set the flow rate, that becomes the independent variable. You can't control R, the resistance of the aspirate. So what happens is that E, which is the vacuum build on the FACO machine, is proportional to resistance. So what that tells you very simply is that as you aspirate more dense pieces of lens, the vacuum will build higher. And the rate that it builds higher is determined by this, by how fast the flow rate is. The faster the flow rate, once you occlude it by the resistance being high, then the vacuum force will build up and up very quickly. So in some of the machines, for example, in the Alcon machines, you can set the dynamic rise. And all that does is it, uh, Alcon has set the machine to pump fluid through faster if you want the rise to go quicker. tighter, quicker, but it also increases the risk. Because when you do that and the dynamic rise is very fast, then also when you eat through the piece, the dynamic fall will be very fast. So you're going to get occlusion breaks. So what happens with these pumps is, how safe is a peristaltic pump? That's the question you always want to ask, not just how fast it can aspirate nucleus, but is this a safe system? Well, when the vacuum increases, when nuclear density increases, what happens when resistance goes to zero? Well, since E varies as R, that tells you the force goes to zero. So in a peristaltic pump, as soon as you break the occlusion, the, uh, the flow continues at the same rate, and the vacuum then goes to zero. So by design, FACOs, like with venturi pumps. So this is the other thing you have to understand, that when you set a dependent and an independent variable, and that you cannot control R at all, um, because it just depends upon the lens. All right, so it's important to remember that a peristaltic pump, when the rise of the, the rate of rise of the vacuum is proportional to the flow rate you have, and what will happen here is when the resistance goes to zero, when you break through the nucleus, the force will go to zero. So by its design, without having any extra sensors or dependency on anything else, this is a safe design. Up to zero, once we've gone through the piece of nucleus, this goes to infinity. That's why you get a surge in anticipating the cortex. So in all these machines, you can mimic somewhat the other one by putting in sensors to control it. So for example, when you set your machine in the Alcon machine, which is peristaltic, to aspirate cortex, they can set it so that when you set a high flow and vacuum to aspirate cortex, that the machine has a constantly faster flow rate to keep a limit of vacuum going and not let the vacuum fall to zero. And that's why people tend actually to break the posterior capsule more often when they aspirate cortex than when they're doing the nucleus, because the machines are being set to make the surgeon happier. Um, so by, by basic design, the Venturi or vacuum-based machines are not as safe as peristaltic machines. But when they put in sensors, they put in sensors in the line in both kinds of machines, multiple sensors, to change the way it functions a little bit to make the surgeons happier. 
So first, do you have any questions on this? This is the most important thing to know about FACO machines, because this is how they work. No matter how you twist it, that's how they work. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you, Steve, for this uh, well-explained uh, points. But actually, the, 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 the uh, frequent question about this point is uh, the, yeah. brist the bristaltic, bristaltic pump and the venturi pump. The bristaltic pump needs the bristaltic uh, vacuum means that the, the vacuum will build up after occlusion, right? Hello? Steve, can you hear me? So the equation tells you that vacuum becomes a function of resistance. Yeah, okay, I lost the answer because the, the, uh, the internet is unstable somewhat. Yeah, so one of the points about this is suppose you sculpt. Some people go and they go to meetings and say, well, I set my, uh, my vacuum limit at 800. So when you sculpt and the tip of the FACO is not totally occluded, have you ever looked in build anyway? But when you chop and you occlude the FACO tip with the nucleus, then you're allowing the vacuum to build. So it's much more important when you're doing chopping because you're actually holding the nucleus and moving it. So instead of us saying, we don't want to do that and we want to sculpt, we should say, this may give me an extra advantage because it does, because the ideal way to do cataract surgery is to bury the phaco tip just to the right of the center of the lens, if you're right-handed. Yeah. pushing on the capsule at all. That's much safer than sculpting and pushing against the capsule. So you can use this to your advantage by doing that. So you, you hold the nucleus and the more dense it is, the more firmly it will hold with higher vacuum. So you go in, you fake a bit, you then raise your foot pedal a little bit, so it just holds it, and then you chop it in half. So it makes it, you can use the, you, All right, so once you know that, the next question is, okay, suppose I don't, I don't want to have trouble in my surgery. So I'm sure you've heard many, many things, and I can tell you a lot of the things that you hear at meetings, they simply aren't true in terms of physics. People tell you stuff, and they're based upon my experience was. The truth is, no one knows what the heck you did in your surgery. And what you tell people is what you think you did, but what you actually did with your foot pedal and your hand and everything else may be something a bit different. So the question is, why do you get wound burns? Well, wound burns occur if you have continuous phaco and you have no flow of fluid. The fluid cools the tip. So what you do to avoid wound burns is you always use pulse. There is no advantage to always having continuous phaco. When you have continuous phaco, most of the time you're pushing the lens away. In the lens. If you use pulse, it gives the nucleus a chance to come back against the, the tip and work better. And then what you want to do is aspirate a little bit of OVD before you start to do the phaco. And then people have blamed different kinds of OVDs Helon 5 is one of the OVDs that has the least chance of burning the wound. You will burn the wounds mostly with dispersive OVDs because a dispersive OVD is like a solution of dense sugar. And to an eye that's full of viscode or even HPMC, until you get a pocket of water, you're, you're increasing the power, but you're sucking up this, this thick viscous fluid, and by the equation of E is equal to IR, it means that
to where you're aspirating very little fluid to cool the tip. And so you will tend to burn the phaco tips if you use continuous phaco and if you use dispersive OVDs. If you use cohesive ones, they can stay in the top part of the chamber and you can Where you put a little layer of balanced salt below the OVDs, all you need is a little tiny bit of fluid to allow flow and you cannot burn the, the incisions. So the three points about wound burns, use pulse, be careful to aspirate some OVD if you use dispersives, or use ultimate soft shell technique where you always have a little bit thin layer of water. Next, if you have a dense lens, how do you avoid All right. People, when they are faced with a dense lens, they say, oh my God, I have six more cases this morning or 10 more cases or whatever. I better hurry up. And they want to somehow make the nucleus go faster. It's not going to go faster. That's, that's just the way it's going to be. It's going to take you two minutes more to fake with the nucleus. But if pieces away. And every time you go into the very center of the nucleus to grasp the perimeter of the little hole you make by putting the phaco in, that little hole gets bigger and you're gradually taking away the hardest part of the nucleus by just putting in your phaco tip to grab And after you've gone around once or one and a half times, it just falls apart and it's easy. So the trick is take your time. The best trick is if you have money, use femtos. Femtos are phenomenal for dense cataracts. Dense cataracts become like doing grade two. Into little tiny pieces and it becomes very easy. Okay, so that's for dense lenses. And how about very, oh, the other thing about soft lenses, what do you want to do? Well, is learn to do it better. Don't learn to do it faster. If you learn to do it better, it will go faster. If you learn to go faster, you'll break a lot of capsules. So just try to get better and better and more conversant with all the parts of the surgery and you'll do better and better. Are there any questions on any of these things? Uh, uh, Dr. Mohamed Khed? I do a case. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you, have, you have a question about the, the last point? No, 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 no. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, okay, Doctor Steve. Before going to the second point. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, because I missed the answer of my question because of the internet, uh, I will ask it again. When I start training a beginner in the fecal emulsification, I I'm I'm telling. The, the, the junior surgeon to be to, to go close very close to the fragment and then start the, the pressing the foot beetle to the step two which which uh, will start gradually the vacuum then till hearing this the sound of the occlusion the, the people are moving yeah no so I leave the infusion on and the flow rate about 30 I leave it relatively low <clears throat> all the time but I only engage the FACO uh, when I'm actually holding the piece. Yeah. There's no point in FACOing water. Uh, it just burns things, doesn't do any good. So you, you're always pulling your foot up and down. Yeah, okay. So what I do in this case, 
I try to get rid of chatter because when you have a dense lens, when you FACO, the FACO pulses are very fast. And most of your time is gonna be spent burning water and not doing FACO. So as I want my foot pedal to go down, I want to take and space out the pulses more and make them higher. So in other words, here you see you have very intense pulses, but mostly space in between and a very short pulse. And so I set it so that as I adjust my machine, by making the power is higher, the FACO pulses are further separated. And so you tend not more energy in the eye for a dense lens. You're just changing the spacing of the pulses and the power of each pulse. And that way you don't burn eyes because you're using the same energy for a dense lens as for a soft lens. In reality, after you do this a few times and you keep playing with the setting, you'll prefer it so that you gradually do get a bit more power, but power from a soft lens to a dense lens by let's say 30% but not very much. So you can set it up so you can increase the power. So you can see here that you went from these widely spaced ones to they're very close still, even though the power is high and here you spread them more and spread them more. And here you actually have decreasing power. This is useful in is a soft lens. And so I set this so that when I aspirate and chop the lens, and when I aspirate the little central piece, it's harder. I put my foot pedal down in you think you're actually using the power as a soft lens, except for the brief part where the lens is um, so when you set the energy to go into the eye to be relatively constant, then it just the pattern changes and it's much, much safer for your eye, for the patient's eye. So why do you want to use uh, CVP? Well, you get more efficient FACO. It permits you to reduce the aspiration flow rate because you don't need to have high flow to rise and makes the procedural step simple because you only have one step, chop, and the rest is controlled by your foot pedal. And it reduces the turbulence in the anterior chamber, and it's better. Set it so it goes from zero to 90, and then it goes from 100% here down to like 15 over here. So that as the foot pedal goes down, you get more and more spacing of it. And a gap every once every second or so, a little tiny gap of 20 milliseconds. And the same thing for the torsional. This part is not critical because to 300 or 320 because it's, it doesn't reach it anyway. And I made dynamic rise too, so it actually increases the flow a little bit when I hold a piece of nucleus. It's hard uh, to build up the vacuum a bit quicker, uh, but not. So for uh, more dense lenses, for simple lenses, I might leave it at 30 if it's a regular RAID 1 lens. But the more dense the lens, I'm going to lower the flow rate so that things occur more slowly in a smaller space. If you use OVDs like Helon 5, for example, and you fill the anterior chamber with it, and then you make a little space of balanced salt below it, get is the same as if you had a higher flow rate in the entire anterior chamber. So it allows you to do dense lenses with very low flow rates and it just goes very low against the cornea whatsoever. It just makes everything much simpler. Simple is always good. Uh, uh, be, be, before getting to the next one, what, what, what yeah. actu what's the actual cause of chattering? Chattering is like this. Suppose you're boxing, okay? Suppose you're uh, a tough guy and you're uh, 20 years old and you're a boxer. Yeah. And you go into the ring. And one day you go in the ring and you're fighting against one guy who's all muscles. Yeah. Right? 
<laughs> suppose you go in the ring and the guy weighs 80 pounds more than you, looks like he's out of shape, but he's kind of fat, and you punch him. What happens to the punch? Yeah. It gets sucked into the fat. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. He doesn't bounce anywhere. <clears throat> so there's the same thing with the faco. When you hit a dense piece of lens, it bounces off yeah. with an actual faco. When you hit a soft piece, it gets absorbed. So the harder the lens, the more you're going to get chatter. The chatter is a movement back and forth where the, instead of the phaco breaking the lens piece, it just bounced it away. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. once you bounce it away, there's no point in having the phaco on because the phaco is here and the nucleus is here. So you're yeah. not doing anything. Yeah, the, the, the go on the front movements. Further. Yeah, so you yeah. want to let, let the nucleus come back. They go on the front it. movements, they go on the front movements in front of the fecal, right. uh, the fecal tip here. Uh, right, so actually, actually, it's responsible for the spinning, the spinning movements of the last fragment, especially in the hard cataracts. The spinning is mostly occurs because of the, the fluid flow. Yeah. And if you want to increase the spinning, and one of the tricks to make it spin to go into the, the phaco tip better is when you do energy is put into the eye, what I do is I bounce my foot. So if, if you're doing a medium density lens and you bounce your foot, you'll keep changing how the phaco is attacking the piece of nucleus. And so it, it, it hits it, breaks it apart, and sucks bits out. So it'll, it'll rotate it as you do the surgery. And it makes it uh, much easier because the whole thing goes easier that way. Okay. So what I do is... Uh, okay, is, based, uh, based on, excuse me for interruption, but based, no, based, no, based, based on all these uh, uh, factors and uh, 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 adjustments, uh, uh, when I deal with the last fragment in the brown character, where is actually, where, where is almost no, uh, no cortical matter and no protection of the posterior capsule, what's the perfect uh, interocular pressure? Ask you pizza, use a Coke rotator. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, uh, the internet Maybe, is not I didn't quite hear you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I will. I will uh, uh, repeat my question again. Okay. <clears throat> In the very dense cataract, uh, uh, almost the brown cataract, there is yeah. no, there is no uh, uh, epineucleus. There is no cortical matter protecting the posterior capsule. When I, um, I, uh, when um, deal with the last fragment, which is somewhat tricky and dangerous uh, fragment at the end. With a higher incidence of the posterior capsule rent, what, what's the perfect way? The, what's the perfect parameters on the FACO machine? What I do, I use the parameters just like this. I don't change anything. Yeah. But I use uh, for the last two pieces. Upper for a Coke rotator. Coke is it's like a finger sort of thing, and, and it's curved. And I put the Coke rotator underneath the FACO. And I use it to rotate the last pieces of nucleus so that they're easily accessible by the phaco, and I push them towards the phaco. And then the slowly push your foot pedal down and up, and the pieces will rotate in without causing any turbulence or change of flow in the eye. Yeah. Because it's very gentle, and the piece will rotate in. Oh, man, and then you have the cochlear behind it, and the cochlear is a soft, it was metal, but it's curved and it will not harm the capsule. Yeah, okay, and but but do you think do, do you think as many surgeons think uh, think about the uh, posterior capsule rent from the sharp edge of this fragment? Do you think do you think so? Actually I'm not. What about you? No, I, I don't find it difficult at all. Because when you have settings like this, you don't have a last piece. I back up my foot so it's just gentle and I only exert the power I need to get it to eat it. Yeah, okay. Uh, 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 do you prefer to, to put it's your... Like if it's caught on it and it's dense, you can briefly put your foot down. Yeah, okay. So you prefer to to stay at the main incision and grasp by by a slow slowly uh, increasing vacuum the last fragment to the to the anterior chamber away from the posterior capsule, or to go to go behind to to, to run to, to to catch it. 
I do. I leave the sacro at the pupillary plane or a little bit behind it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the the fecal uh, tap, uh, the 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 tap down or above the groove about the uh, the bevel, the bevel down or up. Oh, uh, I like Kelman tips, yeah. and I often turn them when I get the last piece. The piece are. Yeah, about the, the types of the of the taps, the curved, the kinked one, and the straight one. Uh, th there are different uh, uh, benefits from each one. Uh, yeah, I like curved ones better. Kelman is better here. Because what? You actually get a better effect on the axial pulses also. Uh, I'm sorry, Hosem, I, I can only hear half what you're saying. Yeah, okay, and, and the me too. I have part of the answer and the, I, <laughs> I, uh, I'm, losing, better for you. I'm losing the other, the other half because of the internet and stability today. I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, I, sw I switched off the old devices in my, in my home, about the kids and the other devices, but still. So they can't still. watch TV, poor kids. <laughs> no, I switched off the old devices, but uh, yeah. up till now it's still unstable. We will try to, to complete. Uh, the, the Kelman tip is much better than the street one. But if I, if I have the street one, there is any percussion or any recommendation to use it? When to use the bevel up and when to use the bevel down and so? So when I put it into the nucleus, the bevel is always facing up because I want to bury it in and to hold the nucleus initially. Uh, when I'm aspirating the pieces, I tend to slow turn to the side and upside down. Uh, as I go around and get the pieces up, whichever way I have a better access for wherever the piece I'm trying to get happens to be in the eye. So I want to have the bevel it's not complicated. And I think that it It doesn't make any difference. It's not the chamber is very stable if, as long as you have tight incision. Okay, it's not related to the endothelial injury if the bevel up or down. No, it's, it's the position where it is matters. If the bevel, if the bevel faces something, then yeah. that part will get more damage from the radiation of energy. For example, Abe Vazavara did a study about oh, 15 years ago, uh, looking at using Kelman tips and, and OVDs and things, and what he found out was that the post-op pressure spikes he got were dependent upon whether he did the surgery or his fellow did. And it wasn't only how long the FACO was on for, the FACO time, it was also because since he's an experienced surgeon, he was happy to put the FACO tip into the bag more uh, and work in the middle of the, let's say the rexus, whereas the fellows would tend to tilt the, the FACO back and they had the um, end of the needle aiming towards the angle. And so by radiating the angle with energy, they were making the, the uh, pressure higher for a couple of days by damaging the angle. Uh, yeah. Helium, it's, it, you, everything worries you. So wherever you have the, the pulses going and the tip angled towards, that's the part that might get the most radiated energy. Yeah. Okay. Let, let, let's let's uh, l let me ask a basic question. What the torsional power? Yeah, for for all of us, we know the the torsional power and how to, how uh, does it work? And and uh, uh, um, at any situation, I need to add the, the longitudinal power to the torsional one. It's always better if you use longitudinal as well. Torsional just goes back and forth. It's not as good at breaking hard pieces of lens. You, you always, imagine that you're boxing again and you want yeah. to knock guy over. A straight hard punch is better than sort of bouncing around. Like the, right? round, the, like the round, yeah. like round heads, yeah, okay. But actually the torsional is superior to the longitudinal power in protection against the uh, capsule, capsule rupture. I think it, I don't think capsule rupture is a function of whether you use axial or torsional. I think that's a, it's a rupture of your fluidics and how stable the chamber is. Yeah, let, okay. let, let me ask you the question in another way. The, the coaxial or the limitation power can open the posterior capsule by itself? Uh, 
uh, uh, did you get my question? No. Okay. <laughs> I got everything except I, for the question. <laughs> I felt I, I felt that. Okay. I will repeat it again. As somebody uh, as somebody told told us that the uh, longitudinal power may rupture, uh, may cut, may rent the posterior capsule if directed uh, uh, directly to the posterior capsule itself behind the fragment. But the torsional power doesn't do that. Is it, uh, is I, it I don't think that FACO energy itself will rupture the capsule. Yes. Really sharp chips. If you go really, really close, you might, but I mean, yeah, it, it, you would aspirate and break a it, piece of capsule off. Yeah, it should be a combination of, uh, of aspiration and power together. Yeah. Right? But you have no reason to have the FACO tip that close to the posterior capsule. As long as your fluidics is stable, there's quite a bit of space. Yeah, okay, but if it's not stable uh, in case of one leakage, or if, uh, uh, if there's uh, so, some, some uh, of, uh, of my residents may start to put, to dip the, the FACO tip inside the fragment. And so the, the tip may be masked by the fragment. So I'm recommending all the time, don't do anything blindly. You have to, uh, to slip it again and grasp it from a, 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 an, an upper or clearer point. Uh, and, and so I'm asking about that because the posterior capsule may come close to the fragment and when you dab the, the fecal tip inside the fragment, it may pass back to the posterior capsule. And this is a common mistake uh, uh, with a beginner, so I'm talking about it. You, you have to grasp the fragment and when you... That won't happen if you do the following. What I do is, uh, or I advise residents also, is that as you break apart the lens, you should leave one or two small pieces of lens in the bag uh, yeah. as you take out yes. the other ones. Yes, yeah. And then you, take out the ones that aren't dangerous at the end. You just take the co rotator and you sort of swish them out and then you aspirate those at the end. But, but they'll uh, keep the capsule open. Okay, I'm talking about the, the harmonic, harmonical or the, the, about the harmony of the uh, neuro, uh, uh, which is related to the neurological and uh, uh, the muscle, what's called the musculoskeletal and neurological harmony, uh, may, may be built after a time. So if they are not organized together, the, the FACO probe adjustment of putting inside the eye with the adjustment of the foot pedal pressure or uh, the, the depth of pressure on the, on the foot pedal may, may be uh, not adjustable and may be not corresponding uh, at the beginning, so you you may find that it's um, it's easier, or it's more frequent to grasp the capsule while you are not uh, 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 alert about that. So I'm talking okay. that the recommendation don't do fake emulsification inside the bag. You have to start to occlude, and then grasp the fragment up in the pupillary plane, and then yeah. uh, complete your fake. Uh, emulsification. See, if you teach them to do this and to have this kind of uh, CVP, then initially when they put their foot pedal down, they enter into a very, very low power FACO and they're not likely to damage anything. So if the lens is dense, it'll just hold the lens and it won't FACO it. So, but if they put their foot to the floor, they might go through the capsule. So yeah, okay. you, never, you never cause harm by not putting your foot pedal down enough, but you cause harm by putting it down too far. Okay, the CVP, okay. You, I will try to review it again on the machine. Actually, we, yeah. uh, we, we may, we may uh, miss a lot of points on the machine because we are using the, the, uh, the usually um, used uh, 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 program and setting. Uh, one of the old thoughts, I, I will take it. I will take it easily, and I will tell you freely that one of the thoughts is that the longitudinal power should be added if you have a dense cataract. Don't add it to the torsional. I'm I'm used to uh, do my FACO cases on the torsional bar of seventy or eighty. Uh, You'll do better if you do both because it's just just it, the way it works. It works better, and you use a lot less energy in doing the case. Yeah. And you'll find if you do this that your your consumed energy is about a half or less per case okay. for any, every 
Yes, perfect. Which machine do you use? Do you use this or a Centurion? Because I can change the picture to a Centurion. No, just Infinity. The Centurion, I, I have used it just one, one, once in just two okay. cases. Two cases. But uh, we, we, we don't have Centurion, the old centers here. But the, 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 uh, the magic one here and the, the upper hand for the Infinity. And, and okay, no, the Infinity works. That's why I showed this, because the Infinity works extremely well. And all these things were designed on the Infinity, so that it works fine. Yeah, okay. Uh, I cannot judge the Centurion because it was just one time to use it. But, okay, I, okay. Uh, but I will ask my dear panelist, Dr. Hedron, Dr. Mudether, about their, about their experience with the Centurion and the Infinity, and if they have any comment about that. Dr. Hedron? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the other hand, for the Infinity. Uh, most cases done uh, by Infinity, few cases by Centurion for uh, another cause is uh, the Infinity, the room is busy. Uh, have uh, the patient is hepatitis C and the, this is the last case well done on the Centurion. Uh, I'm afraid for the first time to do on the Centurion, but uh, I found it is very, very, very excellent machine. Uh, but I don't have it in uh, my center uh, to work on Centurion, but the Infinity is the, it, it has the upper hand for, uh, for me at least. Uh, uh, but in generally, uh, both machines are well and good. But the, the first choice for the Infinity, because we are a very familiar with, uh, with the machine. Right. Yeah. It works, yeah. it works perfectly well, I guess. You just set it and it's very easy. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. But but I I I, I lost. Uh, I, I don't have experience for the parameter adjustment of the Centurion. This is the first uh, point. Uh, make me uh, uh, awareness of, of or fear from the uh, the Centurion. Uh, but the Infinity, I am uh, highly familiar with the parameter adjustment. Yeah. That's, what that's, you do with the, with the infinity is you just you click on this one the torsional custom pulse one of the boxes on the on the menu and all and these boxes come up and you just play with them so you can play with these arrows and set them the, how you want. Uh, the 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 most important point in the infinity is the torsional power it's very helpful i i, I do you have to use both yes yes I, better if you use both yeah. I do cataract uh, first, second uh, degree nuclear hardening with zero uh, longitudinal power, but torsional 80 or, or 70 uh, torsional, and it worked very well. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, uh, you can, but you, you're using more energy than you have to. I, I, I have zero longitudinal power, but 80 uh, torsional uh, in the sculpting. Uh, and I will contend with in the FECO2 and the uh, uh, fragments removal uh, with, with uh, IP, IP uh, yes. intelligent is intelligent. very, yes. very helpful. Uh, it, it gave me uh, the power I will need uh, for a few moments, then return to the uh, original preset value of vacuum, whatever of the uh, ultrasound, uh, whatever the longitudinal or the torsional power. So what uh, IP yeah. does is when you when the IP goes on, it means that the torsional has got caught. It's building vacuum to a point beyond which the machine wants to accept it, and the torsional is not adequate to eat up. So it goes and gives a bunch of axial pulses. That's why you feel the extra power. It gives a burst of three or four or five yes. axial yes. pulses. Yes, yes. So yes. you see, you would if you put IP on and you use CVP the IP would almost never kick in because you would never get into that position because you'd be putting in intermittently axial pulses anyway. So you would never get caught. The CVP is related to the torsional power? So the no, CVP no. was what I designed and then Alcon yeah. went eight years later and made IP to avoid paying me a royalty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the last time, the, the last time, well, I were, uh, well, I was doing a FECO case and and found that there is some some troubles with the, with aspiration and the, with cutting of the, the fragment. I turned it to the assistant. What what about the IP? It was off. So I went. Right, yeah, because yeah. You, were it, you were yeah, getting yeah, the axial yeah. I felt I felt that there is something uh, uh, um, uh, abnormal with me. So I went. She punched the 
uh, the IP, the, the, um, the operation uh, events was totally different. different. Right. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's why it's better to use this because it's always giving you intermittent axial pulses. Okay, I will. Right? Yeah, I will. So I, you never I get will. caught. The problem yeah. with torsos is you get caught sometimes. The yeah, more yeah, dense yeah. the lens, the more often it'll get caught, and the more often IP will kick in. IP okay. just means a string of axial pulses to get you out of the trouble the torso gets. Yeah, really, Dr. Steve, this is a new concept about the machine. I will go tomorrow to my infinity to, uh, to, to review this setting again about the yeah, CVP. It's very easy to do. It's very, because, very easy. Because I didn't find the, the, this screen uh, items. It, you, have to, you have to kick this torsional custom pulse yeah. menu. Yeah, okay. From the bottom of the pulse menus. Okay, I will, I will do and yeah. tell you about uh, the, the, uh, the, the, yeah. newer, the newer events. Dr. Modester, I think you have a comment. Uh, I, I uh, unfortunately, uh, to Steve, I uh, don't have any uh, previous experience with Centurion, uh, but uh, because it is not available in our department or in my private center, um, I, I, I'm, I'm totally satisfied, completely satisfied with the Infinity machine, as it's very safe and efficient in dealing with the different types of cataracts. But I, I, I want to comment about two points in, our, uh, uh, in your presentation. Uh, as regards the uh, posterior capsule rupture, I think uh, the posterior capsule rupture, by, uh, if it is entrapped in the FECO tip more than by uh, FECO power. FECO power, uh, I think, is not so harmful uh, for, uh, to, uh, to the degree to uh, produce uh, posterior capsular rent or capsular tear. Uh, as, uh, also, as regards the bevel of the tip, I think the angle of beveling is much more uh, important than the direction of the bevel. Uh, what do you see? Right. Uh, I agree with you, and I agree it doesn't matter how much power you have, it's, it's the fluidics that gets yeah. you in trouble with posterior capsule rupture when you allow the chamber to collapse. Yeah, yeah. And it the critical thing for fluidics is you have to have tight incisions. If your incisions yeah. are tight, you, you will almost never break a capsule. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but please, Dr. Steve, to complete this point, uh, if if we got if we got a wider uh, incision than the FECO probe, and there's some leakage, well, what what to do intraoperatively? How how to how to readjust your fluidics or your prime? So you can raise the bottle. It depends how much it's leaking, right? Yeah. So so normally speaking, the height of the bottle times 0.75 is the pressure you have in the eye. All right. So yeah. if you, let's say, have a leak and you're leaking a third of the fluid, that means your pressure not, is not going to be, let's say here, it's going to be 75, it's going to be uh, 55, it's going to be then 40 or 30. Yeah. And then the whole thing becomes unstable below 30 or 40. So when you're vacuuming it in quickly, after you get an occlusion break and the vacuum is a bit stronger, the chamber will start to shallow. And you'll see the capsule go like this a little bit. Yeah. And so you can erase your bottle so the infusion is faster. But if the leak is too much, that won't be enough to help you. What you do then is put a, a suture across the incision. Okay, well, if I increase the bottle height to the maximum, to its maximum, uh, what about the flow rate? If I decrease the flow rate, it will help me? If you decrease the flow rate, it's more stable. Yes. Yeah, the flow rate when increasing will keep the, the, the fluid inside the eye more Right. And deep in it. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Dr. Sam, I, uh, Dr. Sam, yes. I think, I, I think, Dr. Sam. Yes. I think, I think in uh, leaking uh, main incision, it's better to lower the, uh, the bottom height uh, to reduce the turbulence inside the anterior chamber uh, than well, raising the bottom more. The turbulence occurs because the airflow is so high through the leaking incision. So you're, you're yeah, yeah. by a shallow chamber or turbulence. You can't win other than putting a suture across the incision. Yeah, okay. Uh, also, also hydration of the angle of suture may help in reducing the leak. Yes, okay, okay. the hydration may, may, may help decrease the hydration. The hydration, the, the, the side hydration. Yes, the side hydration. Help to decrease, of, uh, yeah, the hydra stromal hydration of the bone. But l let me to disagree uh, with the bottle height. To decrease it will, in, will decrease the fluid and you will, will, will get shallower uh, anterior chamber. But if More chance of uh, yeah. breaking the caps. But if you increase the, the, the height, will increase the rate of infusion and deepen the anterior chamber. 
uh, but about the turbulence, as Dr. Steve. But the inter chamber said. will be will be un very unstable. Will be will be uh, very, very unstable. See, everything has a bad point. So if you hydrate the incision, that's fine, until you want to go aspirate the cortex, because then you yeah. can't see around probably a quarter of the eye what you're doing, and you may may break the capsule then. So you have to remember that every every time you do something that's not right, you pay for it ten times more later. So when you make a bad capsule excess, you pay for it later. When you make a, a too big incision, you pay for it later. Uh, if you make the incision a bit too far posterior, you hydrate the conjunctiva and then you pay for it later. Every every yes. mistake you make, you pay for. And yeah, so your okay. best to recognize okay, okay. them quickly and fix it as soon as you can. Uh, and that way you have minimal complications. Yeah, actually, actually the, the complication is a builder of the experience uh, to get and manage. Right. But, but actually the hydration of the wound yeah, well, it may solve the problem, but it will get, um, uh, it will cause corneal haziness, which may obscure the, the cortical matter after that. Yeah. But uh, uh, the second question of Dr. Mudassir to Dr. Steve about the bevel up, and the bevel down. Right, Dr. Mohammed? To Mudassir? Sorry, Dr. Sam, I, I, don't I didn't you, hear you, you well. You asked about the bevel. You said something about the bevel. Uh, the bevel, the, uh, the bevel. Uh, I, uh, I have said that uh, the the angle of the be of beveling is much more important than the direction of the bevel. Right. The and angle, I, uh, the angle of the bevel uh, uh, really much. changes the dynamics of how the fluid flows in because it opens the uh, the size of the pipe. Right. So yeah. the angle of the bevel really changes the size of the pipe to get the fluid flowing through. Yes. So it changes the resistance at the at the tip uh, for fluid to flow through. Uh, and then there's, there's compromises. So if it's too steep of an angle, then you have to break up nucleus of smaller pieces to get to aspirate. If it's too flat of an angle, then the, it will also get caught on it. And in between is probably the best. And some people like 30, 45, whatever. But you get to used to uh, something between 30 and 45 and you keep that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The bevel size, the bevel size will will uh, uh, control the the fluid amount, the amount of yeah, fluid, fluid. Yeah, going yeah. into the eye. But uh, it's related to the power. Is it related to the power? The 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 the, the amount. Uh, of power? And well, it, you appear to have more power because you, you have a bigger surface moving with a bigger angle. Yeah. So if it's forty five, you have a bigger surface area breaking up the lens. It's vibrating. If it's thirty, it's a smaller surface area. Right. Yeah, yeah. So people, okay. people like 45 because it appears to cut the lens up faster. Yes. Uh, uh, the bevel may help uh, dividing or cracking of the lens with the tuber itself. If it's yeah. longer and sharper, it may be used as, uh, as an, a, a dividing instrument. Uh, um, right. Yeah, okay. Uh, what, what, what about the, the fecal one program, which is the sculpting program? Uh, I'm actually rarely uh, using using it. I'm starting the the um, chopping or the the fragment uh, in the old. Oh, cases. you mean a sculpting program? Yeah, a sculpting program. The, the I I haven't sculpted for like 25 years. Yeah. I think sculpting <laughs> is the most useless thing to do in fake. Okay. You're just pushing the, against the body. Then, then you have you have uh, to tell Alcon to remove it from the the machine. Well, I do. I, I put mine like this. I change them to chop and cortex. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, bill for the nurse. Uh, okay, uh, but actually, it may be uh, saved for the, the, the very dense carrot. May be helpful in grooving and uh, to do divide and conquer and to divide the old fragments together. I think you make it harder, because what you do when you take away the central nucleus, when you want to divide that piece of lens, it's actually you have to push harder. Yeah, and there's more chance of breaking the capsule. If you actually sculpt into the center and hold it. Yes. You can take a chopper, and I'll show you which chopper to choose later. Yeah. And you can cut it much better. Yeah, breaking the capsule and harming uh, the, the, the endothelium uh, as well. Uh, but uh, actually, with the new, new techniques of the chopping, they are, um, they are depending now about the, the direct chopping to, to grasp the nucleus with a, with a very high and, and power vacuum and then divide by using the tuber, either vertical or horizontal one. Um, about this, this point, uh, I think we have covered it properly. 
but let me to ask the question finally, what the correlation of the, the correlation between the all parameters together, at which case, well, at which case I will increase the vacuum and decrease the flow rate and increase the power. If I increase the vacuum uh, figure, this may help uh, emulsification more or not, or not related no. to it. When you increase the vacuum, the vacuum will only build beyond this for a very dense lens that is abutting against a phaco tip. Yeah. But if you're using torsional, because it goes back and forth, the vacuum will never build. Yeah. Because it's, it's abrading the surface. So you could have, but if you use only axial, you could then build above 300. So a lot of people use torsional and they set this at 800 and say, wow, I do phaco 800. Well, good for you. It only goes to 150. You yes. can set it as high as you want. You can set infinity if you like. It makes no difference. Yeah, okay, but I, ha I have noticed. Flow rate, yes. The flow rate is mostly for corneal protection. So you, you want to decrease the flow if you have tube dystrophy or a thicker cornea that you're concerned about the cell counts because the lower the flow, the less damage to the cornea. Yeah, the you, mean, you, the cornea. you mean that the flow rate, when, uh, when I decrease the flow rate, this will decrease the tear plans and decrease the right. insult of the corneal endothelium, right? Correct. Okay, so but... People but, want uh, a faster flow rate because the surgery is a bit faster. Okay, the flow so rate... By spending a minute more, it saves the cornea. Yeah, yes. Okay, but uh, uh, I, I want to know the flow rate is better to be low or high in the hard case. It's always better if it's low. Generally speaking, in every difficult case, you yeah. always do better with a lower flow rate. To lower, to lower it. So to what I do it. in a difficult case is I use Helon 5 because it's very stable for the anterior chamber. I make a little pocket for fluid so I get more turbulence in the small pocket and I put the flow rate at 15. So the flow rate is, yeah. it takes a flow rate of 25 or greater to wash away Helon 5. Yeah. So if I make a bubble of Helon 5 filling up three quarters of the anterior chamber and put balanced salt behind it, and I yes. work with a flow rate of 15, because yeah. the Helon 5 fills three quarters of the chamber, the flow rate makes the effective turbulence in the capsular bag the same as a flow rate of 45, uh, but it's in a very small space. So that yeah. way it just, it, it makes the surgery more confined and much more stable. Yeah, the lower is safer, but I, I may I may need it higher to uh, to help me in such soft cases. If, well, if, soft cases are easy. It doesn't matter what you set it on. Okay, okay. Because once you once you hold a piece of soft lens, the whole thing just scrolls in. Yeah. Okay. The the flow rate is much better to be lower in the shallow anterior chamber than the deep one. Uh, it's better to be lower in all chambers. If, it, if you have a very shallow chamber, uh, what you I, want to do is you want to, you want to deepen the chamber with Helon 5 because it's the most viscous OVD. Yeah. And then you want to put the FACO into the nucleus and work behind the Helon 5, which protects your deep chamber. Mm. Once you've taken out even one piece of lens, the chamber is now deep. Yeah, okay, but after all these discussions, let me to know uh, 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 an important information. The flow rate means that the, the flow of the fluid from the infusion to the eye, into the eye, and then from the no, eye it doesn't. to the, no, it doesn't. the tip? No, it doesn't. It's only the flow rate into the machine. Yeah. The flow rate the bottle into the eye depends upon how much leakage you have. The flow rate into the machine. So if I, if I have a case with very deep anterior chamber, and I, I, I need to be a diver, to, to go inside the eye to, to, to grasp the fragment. Uh, and, and, and in such case, uh, I, I, may, I will... You lower the bottle height. Yeah, I will. I lower will, the I, bottle height, it yeah. lowers the pressure in the eye and, the, and it comes forward a bit. Yes, okay, but actually uh, the flow rate is not a role in that. To lower or no. to increase. Yeah, okay, this is no, the, the point. The bottle height will control that. This is the point I want to clarify. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mudasser. Do you want uh, to ask any? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I, uh, uh, point of discussion: uh, what What is the difference between fluorite and vacuum, and what is the function of each one? Vacuum, uh, the holding power. Yes. You 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 want to hold the nuclear particle hardly, or hold it loosely, depending upon the vacuum level. Fluorite. 
it means flowability of the particle. How much time spent for the nuclear particle to get into the fecal tip? This is controlled by the flow rate. Increased flow rate will increase the, or increase the fast movement of the nuclear particle to the tip. Yes. The, just the difference is between. That, is that a question or an answer? <laughs> It's more answer, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, in hard cataract, uh, I need holding power, very uh, good holding power, means high vacuum, and high flow rate. High vacuum and high flow rate in the hard cataract, in the uh, cataract negra particle. To, to hold it very strongly, and it come very fast to the uh, fecal tip. Increase flow rate, uh, appreciating the, um, the, the flow of the particles inside the fecal tip and inside the tube. Okay, help with ultrasound and vacuum to aspirate hard nucleus. Flow rate, vacuum, ultrasound. Yeah. Yeah, th th this is when you the, raise your flow rate, what it does is it allows the vacuum to build faster because you're trying, you're sucking in more fluid. So it, this depends upon the fluid being sucked in, uh, the resistance of the fluid being sucked in. So when you raise the flow rate, you will build to this limit higher, more quickly. That's all it does. So if you said, tell me that you're doing dark cataracts and you want to have high vacuum limit, that's because you want to hold it better. So if you want a higher vacuum than this, that's because somewhere you're getting leakage around the phaco tip. And if you use torsional, that's why you get leakage, because torsional causes leakage. When you want to hold a piece of nucleus to chop it, you want to use only axial, because that way the, uh, the hole that you put the needle into is not any wider than the needle. But when you use torsional, because the needle moves side to side, it makes the hole bigger than the needle. And so you need to have more flow and vacuum to hold it. You don't do that, need that if you use axial to hold a piece of dense nucleus. So for a long time, people were saying that they prefer to use mostly axial phaco to do dense nuclei. The reason was you could bury the phaco tip into it, hold it very stably, and you could chop it. If you use torsional, it's hard to hold the lens with that kind of stability. So one of the problems of you guys telling me that you use all torsional is that you make dense lenses harder. More, the uh, surgery yeah. is more difficult. Yeah, okay, I, I, I agree with, uh, with Dr. Bahamut uh, about the, the high vacuum because I have noticed that when I have a, a dense cataract and in, uh, when I increase the, the vacuum up to 400 or even sometimes 450, uh, uh, I, I have found that the, the nuclear fragmentation or emulsification is higher because of the strong, strong aspiration at the same time with the fecal power. The, 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 how, the, high is your flow, your, how high is your flow? But, but, but about the flow rate, I'm keeping it around 20, uh, 20 flow rate in such a case. If I, if I have a noisy and... Uh, uh, I, I mean, if I have a lot of fragments inside the eye, I may increase the flow rate because of the a lot of small fragments inside the eye. I want to they grasp. I want to wash wash them and grasp them by the probe without going behind them because the the risk of of traumatizing the the iris the the capsule. I may increase the flow rate to bring them um, in in a group to the fecal tip. So here's what you're doing. Yes. If you keep your flow rate around 20, and suppose you raise this to 500 for a dense cataract and you yeah. use torsional, yeah. what you're doing is you're making a broad hole in the nucleus where you bury the, the phaco tip, and so it doesn't hold very well. And so what you're doing is you're trying to narrow the space and to have just enough flow that you can raise the vacuum to hold the very end of yes. the phaco tip against the nucleus. It's transient and not very stable. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe unstable, really, uh, especially when I if use you, if you did this, it would be more stable. If you did but, it like this and you use more axial, because yeah. it would go in without making such a wide hole, and yeah. you'd need less vacuum to hold it. 
Oh, actually, uh, it's a surgical, uh, it's a, a surgeon preference at the end, uh, depending on the, yeah, yeah, depending on the knowledge to know the parameters and then to, to do um, the, the, mo the most comfortable setting for you, uh, but on the right way. The torsional, I'm using the torsional on 80 and the longitudinal power just 20 uh, in the hard carrot with the vacuum 400, the flow rate 20, and it, um, it's going well, especially when I use everything, every other minute, I, I'm injecting the viscoelastic on the back of cornea. So there's no harm for, um, for the endothelium. And in the second morning, you will find no coronary edema. So, so it's it's uh, it's built by the uh, by the uh, the own experience, depending on the cases, the meaning of the corneas. Especially, we have a lot of cases with no facilities to get a specular microscopy before the surgery and so. <clears throat> uh, so Which thank OVD you. do you use? The of the the hyaluronate, methyl cellulose methyl cellulose with hyaluronic acid together in the, okay. the hard cases, but usually we are using the methyl cellulose in the medium and soft cases. Right, so that's why you're re-injecting because it washes out very fast. It's diluted by the circulation and washes yeah, out yeah. very quickly. Yeah, the methyl. So I am, if I don't have the OVD in such place, I, I will inject uh, frequently uh, many times during the surgery, which will be uh, done almost in around five or seven minutes. In, in the harder cases, yeah. decreasing you the see, time. I'm, I'm spoiled. I live in a wealthy country, so I use Helon 5 for every case. You, you, and I you, use this sometimes. You are in Canada, you are rich, and you have to do well, that. <laughs> I hope the patients are rich. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, well, Dr. Steve. This makes it much easier because it deepens the chamber, it's all very stable. You can work in confined space, you can partition the spaces. It makes your surgery much easier. Yeah, yeah, okay, actually, but. Uh, we, 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 we have to use a little amount of the viscoelastic because of the unavailability. Uh, it's, it's, it's economic wise, let, let's, uh, let's say it, it's economic wise. We have to cover the, uh, uh, all our surgeries with the, with the minimal amount of viscoelastic. Uh, yeah. about, about myself, I'm, I'm doing most of my, most of my cases visco, viscoless, uh, even implantation of the IL on the infusion, which is called the uh, Hydro implantation in some surgeons. Then you're going to lose a lot more endothelial cells. I mean, you yeah. can, but you'll have more yeah. cell loss. Uh, yeah. Okay. But but carefully, I'm injecting the IL down in the bag, guided by the by the infusion probe inside the bag, and then turning it by the other cannula, and then wash it, wash the remnants of the of any material, and 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 go. It, it don't have. Uh, a problem with the time, with the with the incomplete viscoelastic uh, wash wash out at the end of the surgery, decreasing the instance of any uh, test related uh, 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 visco related test, which is the toxic anterior sickness syndrome. We have you don't get tests with decent viscoelastics. Ever. Yeah, yes. uh, and so, but in hard cases, I have to use a plenty viscoelastic material with both. OVD and methyl cellulose. Yeah, okay. Dr. Mohammed, do, do you want to say any any comment? Uh, I, 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 uh, many, many cases I do it uh, using uh, sodium hyaluronate uh, years ago uh, after injection uh, uh, found uh, floating. <laughs> And yeah. the uh, sodium hyaluronate uh, as Big. price was Big. high. Big. I shift to methyl yeah. cellulose. Uh, uh, methyl cellulose. When I comparing the uh, the the surgery before when using sodium hyaluronate and methyl cellulose, I found the methyl cellulose is is much more better than uh, sodium hyaluronate. Uh, sodium hyaluronate is very very beneficial when you doing rexes. After that, you can use methyl cellulose, very coating, coating uh, properties very well for the endothelium. Uh, when using the soft shell techniques, soft shell techniques, the best cases, uh, when I use soft, soft shell technique, uh, sodium hyaluronate and methyl cellulose. Very, very, very excellent. 
very beneficial. It's Actually. it's it's real. It's real. Not because uh, Steve is present with us. No, 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 no. <laughs> Actually, actually, no, no, no. Uh, but in hard cataract, I will inject uh, dispersive uh, vasoelastic material uh, after uh, chop, and every quadrant I will inject again uh, to protect the endothelium. Uh, the operation the passed very smoothly and post-operative uh, cornea, crystal clear cornea, uh, 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 in spite of uh, very hardening of the nucleus. Uh, yes. So, missile silos, dispersive uh, vasoelastic devices is very, very well. Coating effect is, is, is beneficial, actually. Yes, yes, I agree with you about that, Dr. Hedr, because uh, the, the uh, space maintaining viscoelastic or visco material is so essential in doing rexes because it's a space. We need a space. But after that, we can cover the endothelium much better with the methyl cedrose than the uh, sodium hyaluronate. Uh, right, uh, Arshanov? No. <laughs> uh, yeah. it, it, for you, it's right because of the ones you use. Firstly, you should never refer to anything as sodium hyaluronate because they're all different. Uh, so there are, must be uh, 30 companies in the world at least that make 1% sodium hyaluronate as copies of Helon, and they're all different. And so yeah. to say you use that is like saying, uh, you know, I, I like beer, but every beer is the same. Well, yeah, you have all yeah. kinds of crazy people in the world like German beer or this or that. Y you, know, you, you know Helon? Helon? Yeah. Helon is a company. Is, is the most no, famous. No, Helon's not a company. Helon's an OBD. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, okay, but, but, but the name of the company, uh, yeah, Helen is already, but the most famous name is Helen. It's, it's called, yes. yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mostly used, it's the, it's the commonly used one of the OVD here in Egypt. Okay, so, well, anyway, if you, uh, you probably never learned to use the other OVD, not being critical of you, but I understand that in different countries you have different access to different things. But if you learn to use, let's say, Helon 5, which is much more viscous, you'd find that the surgery is much, much easier. It's very deep chamber, very stable. You can lower the flow rate, nothing moves. You get zero flow of uh, BSS against the cornea. You do the whole case with dense lens like that, and then you take it out at the end. It's, it's much, much easier. Uh, let's, let's do a study about that. Uh, um, I, I will continue implanting the, I, the IL without visco, and uh, you, you will inject the IL with viscoelastic, and study the endothelial count changes, the endothelial, uh, corneal endothelial changes after uh, that in, in, what? in all cases. What, what's your opinion about that? I bet if I give you a, a different lecture on OVDs, because it's about one or two hours just that. <laughs> know, all the ones in the world, how they're made, how they work, what they do. Yeah, okay. That, okay. Because it's a long discussion, and I know that different countries have different ones. Yeah, okay. I think it's not being critical have, because you know the the Egyptians, the Indians, many many countries have devised fantastic techniques to use the OBDs that you have access to all the time. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I know the other ones are very expensive for you. Yeah, okay. Uh, we we have to we have to uh, uh, to put in the consideration the uh, the the uh, medical insurance. I think in Canada this, there is a medical insurance covering all of this. Well. Um, yes, generally speaking, although the, it's not the insurance because it has to do with where you work. So some hospitals insist on buying only the cheapest OBD they can find. Other hospitals have a contract with one company. Everywhere is different. I'm fortunate in that I can do what I want. Uh, most people can't. So yeah. I get, and also the companies give me their OBDs to try because I go then and talk about them and say how they work. Yes. Um, so I have an advantage, but some people don't get many. Yeah, the same here. The same here, is especially uh, our work in the university, we may find that there is no available that to get a, a OVD or get Helen for er, for every case. So you have to use the methyl cedrose instead of. Actually, we we uh, the patients cannot pay for all, even in the private. Right according to the place, according to the, the status of the patients. So in the, in the patients, in the patients who can pay, we, we 
uh, we will do and we will use all of this. Uh, otherwise, we, we are enforced to do that uh, and still keeping the patients and still keeping the corneas and keeping the surgery yeah. outcomes at the same time. I've been a lot of places and I really admire the work of the people who have devised good techniques to use HPMCs and different things around the world. It's really quite impressive. Yeah. But we all learn to work with what we have, right? Yeah. It's Which totally HPMCs do you buy? Do you buy, are they Egyptian made or where are they made? Uh, excuse me, you asked about the Egyptian meat? The Nasolos that you buy, where, where is it made? Which ones do you buy? Uh, when, when to buy? Because there's no source for it here. So where do you get it from? From the uh, importing companies. But where do they get it from? They have to get it from somewhere. <laughs> it from it, the US, I, from India, yeah, America? Yeah. yeah, from the U US and from India. At the same time, okay. both, yeah, from US and India, there is a different categories with different prices according. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, Dr. Hedger. Uh, I, I want to talk about uh, this point. How, uh, why you, you, we implant the IOL under irrigation? Why? Uh, not, yeah. not, not for financial cause only, but uh, when you meet loading of the IOL and the injector, and you know the, the, the quality of the injector here, it's not uh, like uh, European or American. Uh, you fill the cartridge with missile silos, some debris and the, and the cartridge go inside the eye with the, with the IOL, okay? Okay, you, you face this problem. Yes, 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 actually, actually it is. I shift completely to implant under irrigation. Why? Because when you implant the IOL, the continuous irrigation will washing out all the debris at the back of the IOL. And the, uh, uh, when you implant under missile silos, you, can, you will never, we will never wash out all missile silos in the G chamber. When implant under irrigation, you are sure there is no missile silos inside the eye. Uh, immediately post-operatively. You avoid IOP elevation, avoid the anterior segment toxic syndrome, yeah. avoid the post-operative inflammation, avoid and many, many. So I shift to implant as much as I can under irrigation. Except in some cases, I, I need uh, missile silos. But the main is to implant the IOL under irrigation. Not for financial costs. Only. No, I understand. Which IOLs do you use? From which companies usually? Uh, Acrisolf. Then why don't they give you a cartridge? Yes. In North America, Alcarm will give you a cartridge for every lens uh, you put in. Yeah, very, yeah. Not, very, very good, very good IOL and cartridge. But I, in, in many cases, I implant uh, another uh, hydrophilic IOL like Icrel uh, yes. and, and so on. Yeah. Okay. Actually, if we if we uh, have to implant the Acrisoft with its cartridge, and with 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 its a scrolling scrolling pusher, we have to inject methyl inject. before. Yeah. Yes. We, ha yes. we have to yes. inject the methyl before. But I, we, yes. I'm talking. I am talking about the old cases of the uh, implanted Indian uh, IOLs, like the um, IOL, Icre Icre yeah, the the Icrel, Icrel, and the uh, the most the, the one which is famous, but um, uh, no financial names. Uh, sorry, no, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, but, but actually, Dr. Steve, uh, when you do it, you will find it easy. You will find it uh, saving the time and saving the efforts. And no, I, no I, I know it's not hard. Actually, I have in another lecture, I could show you the way that I implant IOLs. What I do when I implant an IOL because the cartridges that we have, we have all like fancy ones, you know, we're in a rich country. Yeah. Um, so we put OVD, usually HPMC, uh, in the cartridge with the lens, and the lens gonna attach it to the injector, which we turn this little screw. There are some that you push, some you turn, it's the same idea. And then, but the injector is designed to seal against the incision. So what I do is I, when I use Helon 5, because Helon 5 is so viscous, I only have to put in Helon 5 just near the incision, and I leave the rest of the uh, and your chamber filled with balanced salt, not with an OVD at all, because the Helon 5 blocks any balanced salt from coming out. 
So it pressurizes the whole eye. I can keep the eye pressure of 30 with a little tiny rim, only a few on five by the incision. And then I abut the cartridge against the incision. So the cartridge goes in a little bit. And then I uh, insert the eye well through the OVD, through the balance salt, into the open bag. There's no movement like when you have irrigation to do it. Everything is nice, nice and stable. And then when I do that, the leading haptic will go and fall into the bag and will open because it's on water, but the trailing haptic will not open because it's sitting in Helon 5. So when I put the IA into the eye to take out the OVD, the force of the IA makes the trailing haptic, because it's still folded, fall into the bag, and the OVD comes out at the same time. So like within two seconds, the OVD is out, the lens in the bag, and it's swirling around. I can show you a video after we do this stuff because I have I have endless numbers of these videos. Yeah. I tend to show that one in my lecture on OVDs. But anyway. Okay, we have to we have to arrange next for time. it. We'll be here forever. Yeah. Okay, should we go on? Uh okay. Now? Okay. Next. No, no, no about the OVD in the next one, yes. Okay, now this shows you this shows you about the IP which we discussed already. And the IP came around in two thousand nine. Uh, so I did CVP in 2004, and Alcon put IVP on 2009. We had a whole discussion. They didn't want to pay me a royalty. And this is how it is on the Centurion, which you don't use anyway, but it has the same two boxes. You can tilt this and like that and tilt this like this. It does the same thing. And here's your torsional settings that you use. And the Centurion uses pressure. And you see the pressure here is 75 because the bottle height is 102. So it's 75% of the bottle height, roughly. It's not complicated to figure it out. And this was one of their illustrations. So they had all these different boxes on which I get rid of. When I, uh, I get rid of the sculpt, the quad, the FP, just keep cortex and chop. Yes. The other machines, do you have AMO, AMO machines or just all Alcon machines in Egypt? The, the, uh, about the machines in Centurion? Yeah, the, the, uh, we, have have, we have, have a signature. We have a signature and the Stellaris, push and long. Okay, so on the signature, you can do the same thing with CVP. If you go to the settings, you then push this button and then you go to the variable white star settings. And from there, you just set it. The ridiculous thing that they did with the machine is they refer to quadrants as, as quadrants of depression of the pedal, not quadrants of the lens. So if you set this, so it's mostly on, and then the off is right as you go down, you make the off time more and the on time less. That's copying CVP on the uh, AMO machines or J and J machines now. Yeah. So that's all you have to do, and it works the same way. Okay. And the BNAL has, has a similar thing where you set it. So <clears throat> to do your settings, uh, this is redundant, but my settings I use a flow rate of 30 to 33. I lower it to 15 in a complex case like IFIS or a very dense lens. And the resistance varies, and so it's the, this is the aspirate. And in my vacuum, I rarely set a high above 300, 330. And I use CVP in every single case I do in every machine because it makes it much more, more stable. Okay. Uh, are there any more questions on Peco machines, or should we go on to the next thing? Uh, okay, okay, before going. <clears throat> yes. Uh, yeah, before going, we can we can conclude for something why the Alcon shifted from the Infinity to the Centurion. What what's uh, the the newer uh, the evolutionary? Oh, another lecture. Yeah. Okay, there were a number of things that bothered them. One, they wanted to have a wireless pedal. Two, they wanted to control the pressure better um, by going to the IOP control of the chamber rather than the bottle. Like as you saw, what happens with the equation with the leakage? How you have other factors that contribute to the instability of the eye. And they wanted to make sure they had even uh, less uh, problem with surge when you uh, break the occlusion. And they couldn't do that without changing to the IOP control in the anterior chamber. And by changing to the uh, IOP control and having multiple sensors all along the tubing and in the Mahifika machine, they could make the surge almost zero. Uh, so they, they changed all those things and they made the handpiece a little better and a few things a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> I mean, yes. for like 
uh, $50,000 or $100,000. It's a very expensive toy, but it, it does those few things better. But there's nothing wrong with the machine you guys have. It works brilliantly. Yeah. That was probably the machine for which Alcon took over most of the world market for making that, that machine. It was excellent. The Centurion is a bit better, but not as much better as, as they hoped. It's a little better. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's not just a new world name. No, no, it, had, it actually is incredibly stable fluidics and uh, the FACO is easier. The hand pieces are a little bit smaller and narrower. So it's the smaller the tip, as long as everything else is set well, the better the FACO will work. Yeah. So, so, so the question, how to prevent surge? How to prevent surge? Well, that's, yeah. that goes into the design of the machine. The best way is to not have leakage. Yeah, if you already okay. have infinities and have no leakage of your wound, you but, won't get much surge. But with some machine, I, I found that is, despite of, there's no uh, leakage. The b &L that you have probably has the most surge, especially if you use a Venturi pump, because it, yeah. by nature, Venturi pumps surge a lot more. Yes. The AMO machine is a copy of, uh, you have the copy of Alcon's machine, not quite as good, so it has more surge. And the Alcon machine has the least surge. So with the Venturi pumps, I, uh, to prevent surge, I have to control my my uh, my foot my foot pedal. Just or there is another an, or or there is another thing to do with. Uh, well, do you have a, a dual pump on your machine? A Venturi or just pump. a Venturi pump? The, yeah, Venturi the newer pump. machines have Venturi and parasolic pumps. Do you have both or one? Uh, 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 supposing that I have just a Venturi pump. Or if you only have one, you have to use your foot pedal to control the flow and things and make sure you have enough flow. Yeah. If you have both, I would change to the peristaltic pump at the end of the case. Uh, so it's yeah. more stable. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. They're coming out, actually, uh, both J&J &J and b &L have new machines coming out, well, now next year, because this year's a disaster for everybody. Uh, they will do all those things better. And they do it really by emulating what Alcon did with different sensors and controlling the machine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I missed your question at the last point. I have missed it. Please repeat it again. The last, the last word. Repeat it. Oh, you missed it. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, what I would do if I had a purely Venturi machine. Yes. is you have to use your foot pedal to control, make sure you have enough flow uh, as you're going along near the end of the case and to, and to back off on the vacuum. If you back off on the vacuum, you won't get as much surge. Yeah, okay. Uh, for the last few pieces of cortex. Yeah, so the yeah. prosthetic is much, uh, is much helpful. Pardon? Yeah, so the prosthetic is much, uh, is more suitable uh, to, to- By design, the peristaltic yeah. won't get surge. Yeah, yeah, but okay. But the get a lot of surge. Yeah, okay. The new so, machines are making, they, they uh, have changed the machine so it will not get as much surge by putting in sensors in different parts of the line. Okay, but, but why do the, the devices have both together? They are complementary or if, if there is a problem with one, can can shift to the, to, to the other? I'm not sure what the question was. Okay, why? The, the two pumps are present in the same device. Oh, well, they used to have only Venturi pumps and people didn't like them, so they put in a parasaltic pump. Uh, okay, just for choice, but they are not complementary. And, and, well, you and, use them and, in different parts of the, sur the surgery. People like to use the Venturi pump because you can zip along and take out the cortex quickly. Yeah. Except for the last piece, then you're concerned about making a hole in the posterior capsule. But if yeah. you don't, use that's very high vacuum it'll work very nicely yes but for faco it's not as safe when you're going to build vacuum right with when you occlude it then it becomes more dangerous for surge <coughs> yes okay you're taking dense nucleus it's much more dangerous for surge than taking soft cortex yes yeah, so the surge is is a quite terrible problem uh, and the faco yeah. especially especially in the end stage when the posterior capsule is not protected Right, Venturi. bounces up and down. Yeah, yeah. so we yeah. have to be careful. I, I think, Marcel, I think Venturi pump is very helpful in uh, posterior segment surgery. 
rather than cataract surgery fecal emulsification. Prostatic pump is so 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 safe. يعني more safer than 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 the tubular pump. Yes, prostatic depends on the occlusion, and so uh, it's, yeah, a st yeah. it's a stepping. While the venturi is is always aspirating without without occlusion, doesn't depend on the. Uh, yeah, yeah, vacuum is vacuum is present in in the even if there is no occlusion of the tip. Vacuum is the vacuum present. Is yeah. So you can get trampolining in the chamber because you get fast flow and it's not occluded, then the slow stops and it goes like crazy again. Yeah, you break the mm -hmm. I cannot forget yeah. the first yeah. time I have used the Venturi vacuum when the peristaltic mode of the goiter has um, had stopped suddenly for some, some error. So I turned it to the Venturi. It was the first time that my assistant turned it to the Venturi. And uh, my, my information was little about the Venturi. So I I was astonished by the, the quick aspiration. I, I felt that the eye is collapsed, is going to be collapsed. Yeah, okay. So it's not uh, recommended for uh, the, la the, the last part of the operation and also for the beginners because of the, the risk. Yeah. So, I mean, personally, I don't like venturis, but some people like them. They yeah. like them mostly because taking out the cortex is quicker. Yes, it's, it's quicker. I don't and like so, them for the venturis at all. Yeah. It's, but, you know, Okay, th your <coughs> Thank you very okay, much so for covering all of these points. I, okay, yeah. how I do FACO. So starting in uh, like 1990, we began to look at ways to chop rather than just, uh, you know, the, the older way. So the first one to do any kind of cracking and chopping was Kelman when he made his Christmas tree uh, caps rectus and he would sculpt and crack and then chop a bit. And then Gim Gimbal would trough and crater divide and conquer, and people often still do that. The only thing wrong with that is the sculpting part, which I think you shouldn't do. Shepard did quadrantic cracking. Howard Fine did his chip and flip. Uh, Maloney and Dillman had a fractional two four. These are all versions of the same kind of thing. And then Gimbal decided to teach people to do down scope sculpting, which meant to start to sculpt very, very near the incision and to go down and then back up again. And that was better. But the whole idea of sculpting really was not successful. The, f the revolution came when Nagahara decided to, uh, to uh, show his video on Faker Chop in 1993. And that was very popular. Then uh, a year later, uh, Paul Koch came out with Stop and Chop. And then Hidehiro Fukusaku came out with Snap and Split a year later. And then I did this one called Slice and Separate, which I'll show you uh, how I did it. It is mostly conceptual. Around the moment. Difficult. And how you do it, and not really, they're all variations of similar things. And there are many more. There was Quick Chop, True True, Slovenia, a whole bunch of different ones. They're all very similar. So I'll, I'll show you what I like to do. So I like to call my surgery slice and separate because I think the idea of chopping the lens makes you think that you're taking an axe of a person's eye. And whereas if you're slicing things, it's like slicing bread. So it's much more gentle. So I take off the cortex first. And then I take the chopper and I put it just inside the capsular axis and I bury the phaco tip into the very center of the lens in all directions. So it's just on the right side of the center line. So I can kind of chop over here and it's in the middle of the lens in terms of depth and just past the middle in terms of going towards six o'clock. And by doing that, I, the lens is totally stable and it will not rotate because you're past the middle with this piece. And then what I do, is I take it, I take the chopper, and I slide it along beside the phaco tip. And so what that does, if it's a dense lens, by the time I get to here, the lens will just crack by itself because it's brittle. If it's a soft lens, I'll have to cut it all the way across, which is why I call it slicing, because you actually cut it like a knife, slicing the lens in half. And then I put the chopper again, parallel to where the phaco tip is, and I pull the two pieces apart. So I call the technique slice and separate, and I think it's simpler. It's not much different from other chopping techniques, but the concept is different. You're not trying to chop and break it. You're trying to cut it apart, which is much more gentle. So then there are instruments I think we should use. For one of them is people have all kinds of hydrosection cannulas, and most I don't like because they flow too much fluid. They're too aggressive, and, and it's not gentle. I like to use uh, Akahoshi's hydrosection cannula. The tip is rounded and soft and it's beveled. And so you can put it under the capsular edge and you can just inject gently and you'll watch 
as you move it around the rectus and inject, you see that it goes around the back and it makes it very, very neat and very simple. And I like it, especially if I do femto cases, because femto cases, when you have a lot of gas in the back, are not terribly stable for the first few seconds. And if you can inject a bit of fluid, and the fluid dissects the last little part, the gas comes out, and then it becomes easy. It's much safer than injecting more, more quickly. And you may be aware, if you do or don't do femtos, that one of the problems of femtos, people have a lot more torn anterior capsular rectus than they do if they do FACO. Um, and so for dense lens, I use try soft shell technique, which I'll show you sooner or later. Uh, I lower the vacuum and the flow to decrease turbulence. The vacuum I keep low and the flow I keep very low. I use Nikkerman's chopper, which is over here. Nikkerman's chopper is the best thing Nikkerman ever invented. It's just a, a vertical piece, like a knife blade, at the edge of the chopper, but it's quite deep. It's almost half the depth of the nucleus. So when you put it in, you can put it into the lens and you can cut it because all the sides, this side, this side, and the bottom are sharp. And so you can put it in and you can cut it. So it's very nice to use it. And after I'm have broken most pieces of the lens. I, I changed the Nikkerman chopper for a Coke rotator because that's totally soft, like a little bent wand, and you can move the pieces without having to cut anything. And I don't want a sharp device in the eye at that time. So I bury the pieces deeply. So I, here you, I am putting in the Fago tip into the middle of the lens, and I take the chopper and slide it along, along this line so it breaks in the middle. And here's a side view of where you're aiming for the Fago to be. Just past the middle in all directions, depth, towards six o'clock, so the lens won't rotate on you. And it just makes them very easy. Um, yeah. So here I actually put a video, not a very good video, I just made it in a hurry. Uh, here you see me taking a patient, and Nickman's chopper just chopped it in half, and you'll see the phaco doesn't move. I just take the chopper, slice it. See, I'm only slicing it within the capsular axis. So you don't have to, it's all very, very gentle on the lens. Nothing's moving. There's not a lot of stress on the lens. It just breaks it. And I leave the pieces there as I move it around to, uh, to break it apart. And that's the end. And then I grab the piece and take them out. And it's very easy. Um, this is, this is also one of my first time use using this particular machine. Yeah, signature machine. Yeah, they asked me to use one, so I took a video. So. Okay. Now, next thing I teach all of my residents is how to hold FACOs. Everyone holds their FACO handpiece wrong. You should hold a FACO handpiece like you're holding chopsticks, but there's two chopsticks. There's the bottom one, which you see over here, between your thumb and your fourth finger, and that has to be stable. And the top one should be mobile, so you can move your fingers back and forth to grab the food. And you can see here that I can move my fingers over the fulcrum of my thumb to grab the food easily. And I'll show you that in a, in a video. And so here we are, if you hold like a pen, what happens to your mobility with the FACO tip? It's not very good. Oh, media not found, perfect. It was here yesterday. Okay, but mm -hmm. chop, chop steak, Steve, is, is hard to, to eat with it. I, I, I uh, saw residents um, have to go to China. I went, but I couldn't learn how to use the chop stick. Okay, well, what you do then <laughs> is you take your FACO handpiece, and you yeah. put it in your hand like this. You put your thumb on one side and two fingers on the far side. You can move it all over the place. Yeah. It's the bottom chopstick that's hard to hold. The top one's easy to hold. So if yeah. you hold it like this, it's quite easy. Yeah. Not like this, because you can't move your hand when you have it like a pen. Not like a pen, yeah, okay. You hold it like this with your thumb in the middle, and then you can turn it, you can play with it, and rotate it, and it's all very easy. Yeah, fine uh, movement, yes. Yeah, so you need to have that, and you want to use the most distal muscles that you can during surgery because you have fine improvement with your more distal muscles. Yeah. So if you hold it like a, a top chopstick, you can move the FACO very easily in the eye and turn it, and it's much simpler. This video is not working for some reason. Yeah. Okay, then I'll tell you about capsorexis. So funnily enough, I did all this work on OVDs and I was accused in the 80s of, uh, of working for the companies by writing papers on OVDs and no one wanted to publish them. They thought that I was biased over one company, although I was writing uh, papers for both uh, cohesive and dispersive OVDs and for high molecular weight and low molecular weight, but they didn't like it anyway. So then I wrote a paper in 1991, I think, uh, or 92, 
about how to do a capsorexis because I, I was trying at the same time as Gimbal to develop a rexus and I had one that was sort of heart shaped and eccentric and a bit and his was perfectly round so he won fine. So I wrote a paper then on how to do it because there were all these questions of whether we should use needles or forceps and how it does. So I showed people how we can either tear things by stretching them or by shearing them. And when you pull things apart, you just stretch it and you tear against the strongest part of the medium. So if you take paper and you, and you tear paper, you're, you're tearing this way against the strongest part of the paper. But if you take it and you fold it over, you're tearing perpendicular to the paper. I don't know if I can show you that, but yeah. And it's very easy. There's no resistance. So the idea is that you want to always be shearing like scissors shear. And by bending over the paper, you're going against the least strength of the paper. So I wrote this paper talking about physics that you learn in grade six. And I became famous all over the world and I asked to give lectures on how to give a uh, decapsular access. Yeah. So I thought it was kind of strange. So the next thing is, is how big should your capsular access be? Well, I think whether you do manual ones or whether you do it with the femto, you don't ever want your rexus to be more than about 4.7. And the reason is the rexus is your savior when things are problematic in cataract surgery. I'm sure in Egypt and everywhere else in the world, we get easy cases and we get very difficult cases. Yeah. When you have a tough case and if you do unfortunately break the capsule, the rexus will rescue you by allowing you to capture the lens. But you cannot capture the lens in a rexus if it's bigger than 4.7 millimeters. And I'll show you why. So here's the, I wrote a paper on this and the math. And what you're trying to do is match up the twice the diameter of the lens with the perimeter of the capsular rexus. And if you do this equation, this diameter has to be 2D over pi. It turns out that the biggest it can be is like 4.7. Uh, so if you want to capture a, four, a six millimeter lens, if you go through the equation, it will not work if it's five millimeters because they end up that the perimeter is bigger than what you're going to capture the lens with. If it's 4.7, it's smaller. It's just a bit smaller, not small enough. So if you want an ideal, make your rexus 4.5 and you can always capture a lens uh, by doing that. It just makes your surgery easier. Okay, Steve. Uh, 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 actually, because of the, the, the time past one, one and a half hours now uh, about the fecal yeah. dynamics and sun capsorexis. I'd like to, to save this, this uh, uh, great uh, slides about the capsorexis and the other steps with the lecture of the OVD and the other parts of the fecal. Uh, and let's go uh, after covering of the fecal dynamics and the, 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 the so weird and so uh, um, important and controversial part to the second topic, which is about the bilateral, the intermediate sequential bilateral cataract surgery. Okay. 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 Uh, uh, an another, another topic, another uh, uh, attractive topic to make our audience uh, alert and awake with us. And then we will complete the other part of this lecture with the other, with the OVD lecture. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. Yes, I'm just, I'm just, um, you see my screen, can't you?